Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, Book Talk with our author, Liz O'Riordan. Am I saying that right? O'Riordan. O'Riordan from the UK. So she, I don't know what time of day it is there, but we're it grateful is. for you. <laughs> Two o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This is what through the, the beauty of Zoom, right? Yeah, so, you're welcome. Uh, uh, Liz has written a book, Under the Knife, which we are going to talk about, and I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Josie, who is going to introduce Liz. And um, mm -hmm. if you aren't familiar with Dr. Josie, she is a fabulous retired oncologist uh, that has is uh, has a wonderful community on her own right and uh, is uh, living with mitochondrial disease and has definitely has a lot of uh, a lot to offer us, a lot of wisdom and support and help. So I will turn it over to you, Dr. Josie. Welcome, everybody. I see some new faces I haven't seen before, which is always good to see that. Um, I am very fortunate this morning to be able to introduce Dr. O'Riordan, who has written a book that you, you didn't need to have read for these sessions. We always want to make sure that you don't feel any pressure to read any of these books. Um, I hope um, you will enjoy our conversation and maybe after that you feel inspired to read her book or follow her uh, social media content, which is growing and very educational. Um, Dr. O'Riordan is a medically retired uh, British surgeon who um, has also... Um, by it, but that doesn't do her any justice, who has gone through multiple bouts of breast cancer and is now on lifelong cancer therapy. And she has found her niche, I think, a, a really beautiful niche to educate um, everybody she can touch, whether they're providers, patients, or anybody who sits in between these two groups. Um, including administrators. Um, and in that sense, I really like the title of her book, which is called Under the Knife, which I will start talking with her about the title of the book in, in a few minutes, because I think that has multiple, multiple meanings. But first, I'll give the word to, to, to Dr. O'Reard and to see if she would like to correct or add anything to my introduction. No, thank you, Josie. What a lovely introduction and lovely to meet you all. Um, it's just a joy to talk about what I've been through and how writing has helped and exploring um, the world of being on both sides of the doctor's table. Yes, that's another. We, we have multiple questions and I think this hour is going to be filled with my questions. But at the same time, if any of you in the audience have any questions, uh, feel free to write them in the chat, or if you wanted to, just give us a sign that you, you want to unmute yourself and ask Dr. O'Rear and yourself, uh, whatever you feel comfortable with. This is no pressure environment. You, you can keep your camera on or off, whatever you feel most comfortable with. We're going with, with the flow. Um, so having said that, I, I would like to start with the title of your book. Because I think that is a beautiful title, and I keep hammering on that, and but I keep finding more meanings. And so maybe I should start by asking you what you meant with the title, um, and that that meaning may have changed over time. Um, yeah. I think. I think the title was the very last thing that I decided on, and I think it's very hard to come up with a title because I know why I wrote the book what title is going to make people buy it um oh. and the original title was like woman with a scalpel um not very exciting at all but you need something to put at the top of the page i'm kind of umming and ahhing and i just thought i'm a sewist i make my own clothes i knit and i crochet and i quite like the idea of keeping it kind of crafty and, and related to all the different ways where i i cut and i do things and the biggest challenge to me was being a surgeon having surgery and not realizing what it was like for all the patients I treated to actually be under the knife yourself so that's kind of where that came from but as you said there are so many different meanings and different layers that can be put on it 
Um, one of the things that keeps hanging above my head is is this visual of the Damocles sword. I don't know how many of you are familiar with, with the Damocles sword. Um, um, it's it's um, Doctor Reardon. Would you would you like to expand on on the Damocles sword and how you feel um, what it means if if you're comfortable and how um, it relates to how you felt almost I would say your whole life, uh, including your childhood. I think. Yeah, I'm just double checking myself to remind me of the moral, but I guess it's you've. Can you just remind me of a story? I, I I know it, but not well enough to explain, Josie. Um, well, it, it in short, it it's um, it's uh, I don't know what it is. It's a moral or a myth or, but it's it's a symbolic. Um, oh, here we go. So description. Go ahead. Something very bad could happen to you at any time. You're you're yeah. living with this fear, and as a surgeon you're living with the fear that an operation could go wrong, you could do harm to a patient, you might make the mistake, you might kill them. And as a junior doctor, you do make mistakes that do lead to people dying. You've got this fear of, am I doing the right thing? And especially when you become a senior surgeon and you're not being trained anymore, no one is looking over you, no one's watching your back, no one's checking over your shoulder. It's just you trusting that all your years of knowledge mean you're doing the right thing. And then when you get and i i was never going to get cancer i never checked my breasts i had a very unhealthy lifestyle and then when you get cancer it's suddenly is it going to come back and can i plan my life because is tomorrow the day it comes back and what do i do this and just this fear and it's it took a good five or six years for me to actually put that fear to one side and say it is out of my control and it's going to make me ill if i spend every day worrying about what might happen but I think actually you took it a step further. I think you took control. You you took the knife, a figurative knife now. Yeah. And it's it's my understanding, but maybe I'm jumping the gun a little bit, um, because I'm I'm abbreviating an hour into three minutes, but you you, you take figuratively speaking, you take the knife and yeah. you have taken it upon yourself to um cut society in a figurative way because what i i think you're doing now in yeah. the book but your mission in life is to educate society on I, yeah uh, you you want to you want to yeah expand on what is yeah. what is now your niche what is now your meaning what you hope to do with this book and what you did last week by traveling through the uk yeah. and and really, so, go ahead. As a little girl, all I wanted to do was to help people. And medicine was the only job. And I loved surgery and I love breasts because there's no body fluids and people don't die. It's safe and I get to explore and create. And I love that. And when I got cancer, my life was taken away from me. I lost my income, my fertility, my purpose, my career, everything went. And I think when you have a major life upset, it's either the worst thing and you wallow in misery or you, you you get through it. You somehow find a way to cope. And I don't know where that inner strength comes from because I am not that person anymore. I was shy. I was introverted. I was very, very private. But I was being treated in a hospital where my husband worked and where I had worked as a junior doctor. And I couldn't imagine not talking about it on social media for nine months. I was going to lose my hair. I'd be recognized. And I thought, Cancer isn't a dirty secret. I'm a cancer surgeon. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm going to tell people. And by trying to explain what it's like in a non-sensationalized voice, because a lot of social media is a bit like TripAdvisor. Oh my God, it's awful. Or, oh my God, it's great. I wanted to give that balanced middle of the road view. And it was a way of me understanding what was happening to me because I was still in denial. And a way of me explaining and reaching out to people and realizing that by saying I've had this, patients would come to me and I could kind of be that voice to say, this is normal, this is okay. But another reason I wrote the book was I had suicidal depression twice as a cancer consultant, just the sheer pain of breaking 10 women a day telling them they had it. And I thought, I want to own the narrative. 
all I want to say this is normal and there is help available. And actually it's been really empowering to help millions of women know that they're not alone. But I still, if you had told me 10 years ago that I'd be standing up on stage in America to a room full of thousands of people telling my story, I'd have said, you're mad. There's no way I would ever, ever, ever do that. But just writing gave me this way to help people that I didn't realize existed and one thing led to another. And it just, the messages I get on a daily basis of women thanking me for what I do just keeps me going. But I, I don't, I don't think... Um, your book is so dense. I think you could have, you could have split it up in multiple, yeah. multiple books, because I think you needed to go through your life path to yeah. come where you are now, because you you couldn't have done it without having been on both sides of the table. No. Um, you quoted very nicely. Um, I don't know the exact quote right now, but somewhere in your book you said, um. It's amazing how little I knew about being on the other side of the table. I thought yeah. I knew everything about um, having breast cancer yeah. as a breast surgeon, but it wasn't until I became a patient, something along those lines. Yeah. How little did I know as a surgeon? And you, you needed to go through that path of suffering and learning and becoming a surgeon and then your, your, t your subtitle of the book is the rise and the fall of a surgeon i i i'm, I'm not so sure i would say fall maybe evolution yeah you, you have evolved and used that life experience um nobody can do what you do um given your background yeah you have that unique understanding where you can make a difference and i think i wanted people to understand how hard it is to train to become a doctor especially in a man's world the sexual harassment the bullying the negative criticism the sacrifices the hours and hours you spend away from your family but then i realized the sacrifices my patients are going through and how hard it is for them when I say goodbye, see you in five years. And by me being honest now and saying, I never talked to my patients about sex. I never told them how to cope with the symptoms of the menopause. I never realized they're desperate to know what to eat. And by being that honest, I hope I can help healthcare professionals realize what their patients are really looking for. But, but I also think I mean, I don't don't know the British system, but the American system isn't set up for that. No, they they, they process these patients like a factory belt. Yeah, and I think I think there is some moral or soul injury um, for providers who uh, some some providers um, really get injured that way because they feel like. I can see this patient for 10 minutes and all I can do is the bare essentials yeah. and I send them on my way and I know there's so much more they need help with. And um, some providers need to be enlightened and, and some, some providers really uh, undergo moral injury and the system needs to be changed to allow them uh, to be able to refer these patients to the right resource or give them more time to help their patients with all these unmet yeah. needs that y you see but you don't your hands are tight and i think time is a huge factor in the uk we get 10 minutes to see someone in clinic because you can't predict how many yeah. breast cancer patients you'll get each week you don't know how many biopsies are going to be positive and it's sometimes you need an hour so you're always running late we are getting busier and busier. The cases are on the rise. It is really, really hard. And that's why I think the future will be digital signposting. We will say there's a load of information you need to know at some point when you're ready. And I can't tell it you all today, but these charities, websites, apps, forums, people to follow will have sensible information you can trust when you need it. I think that is where the future is going. The right amount of information, the right type of information at the right the right time, and um, that's that's why I want to give a little kudos to to Cancer Bridges. But you know, everybody here already knows what they're about. So I'm preaching to the choir. But for those who stumble on this YouTube video, uh, Cancer Bridges has a very nice workshop for those 
who are transitioning from the acute to the long-term survivorship phase and are bumping into these um, issues uh, that, that Dr. O'Rearan just described. It's it's a two hour per week a session that lasts for about three months where you meet with a small group of people and you get educated on relevant topics and you get exercise counseling along the way from an exercise um, exercise a cancer certified personal trainer and that um, has helped many people um, not just self-help but also that peer support that makes the difference to see from each other wait a minute I'm not alone I have uh, the ability to reach out to experts to peers and we're all going to figure this out to, together and something like this on a in a scalable version I think is 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 the way to go and people like you dr O'Rearan, can can make this happen and so i i can't praise you enough um one thing i wanted to also go to if that's okay with yeah. you is your vulnerability this book um you have like you said you used to be very shy and private but you've gone almost overboard in describing and modeling your uh, your struggle uh, but but what I'm going to take from that is your coping methods we all have different coping methods that we can utilize at different times and there is uh, there's better coping methods and there's um, somewhat less healthy coping methods and I, I've asked you before if you feel comfortable mm. talking about this and you you gave me permission to ask this yeah. this question. Otherwise, I would never have done it. Um, but I want you to comment in your way, where you feel comfortable, how your coping methods have evolved over over time. And you mm -hmm. said earlier today you, you, you somehow overcame it, but you're not sure where you found strength. Um, yeah. And that that's a very interesting comment that you made. Um would you be willing to expand a little yeah. bit on on that? So I didn't find out I had cancer in the normal way. If you've read the book, you'll know this. Most people have a test and a biopsy and a result and a biopsy, but my mammogram was normal. My ultrasound showed a large cancer. I knew before they did the biopsy. My surgeon came in and said, I don't know whether I can treat you. In that split second, I knew my chance of being alive in 10 years. I knew I need chemo. It was my job. And part of me went into denial. It's not happening. It's not happening. It can't be happening. But I, I needed to know how bad it could be because although I had patients who died, I'd not seen the reality. And in the first couple of weeks, I spent hours Googling metastatic cancer blogs, trying to find the scariest, most upsetting things I could find because I needed to go to that very, very dark place. My husband told me not to, but it was like this, a wound that you just keep picking, a scab that bleeds. I just had to get that because I needed all this scary information. And then it was too much and I shut it all off. And it part of me was like, even though I'm in the middle of chemo, it's not happening to me. And I can write about it. But my mum said, you're t it's as if you're talking about a patient. You're not talking about you. I just detached all that emotion to preserve myself through it. And I think that's how I got through chemo. Surgery was more real when you suddenly realized you're being walked out into the operating theater and you're naked on the table and you think, oh my goodness, I really am out of control here. And I was really emotional when I woke up from my mastectomy, just thinking this is the end of my life as I know it. My breast is gone, my ovaries have gone, my hair's gone. I was very much histrionic, pessimistic, cut path empty. And then you somehow pick yourself up and you go back to work. And I started a bit of writing and I thought, well, maybe I can make a difference. And then when my cancer came back the first time, I couldn't believe it. And I lost my job. I lost my career again, just rock bottom thinking, how on earth do I pick myself up? And at that time, it was it was the little things I used when I was off with depression. It was being in nature. It was feeding the birds in the garden and trying to find moments of joy in the day, thinking, Cancer hasn't taken me away. It's changed my circumstances, but I'm still a woman and I'm still a mother. Well, not a mother, I'm still a wife. And I'm still me deep down. And how can I find a way to be true to me? And I realized my life up until that point had just been work, exams, work. And I wasn't doing anything for charity. 
or spirituality and my family and friends are very low down because it was all work. So I started volunteering at a local hedgehog shelter and I started swimming in rivers and just started filling in all those other bits of my life I'd neglected. And when my cancer came, and by talking about it, it kind of, it gave me a new career. The thing about being a surgeon is you walk into a room and you know you're going to do something amazing. And it's a bit like acting, putting on a show. And by talking, it kind of scratched that itch. I said, right, I can do this. I can help people. I can make a room full of men cry, which is fun, um, by telling my story. But I know I can make every person in that room take something away that will improve patient care. And that kind of gave me that purpose again. When my cancer came back last year, it was actually the day before my book was launched. This isn't in the book. I had another local recurrence on my mastectomy scar. It wasn't, I wasn't upset. It was just this weird sick sense of here we go again. And the first time I was like, right, I'm much more likely to get metastatic disease. And I, most people live for three years. So I can't plan anything more than three years in the future. My life is over. Now I'm like, well, it's happened. And it's 50-50 whether it comes back again and it's out of my control and all I can do is carry on living my life. But it took me five years to get to that stage where the histrionics go away and I just say, well, okay, this has happened. You don't know what's going to happen in the future. It's just like this learning curve, a roller coaster that you're on. And it's, it's compounded um, by many things that happened in your life before the diagnosis like it, it really builds on that it's like everything is being magnified and yeah. uh, it's it becomes super super messy and um somehow it forces you to deal with everything at once rather than just just it's interesting how it has this capacity to blow it all up it's so it's it's I mean, I'd been bullied at school and I'd had the suicidal depression. I'd been sexually harassed through most of my training. That kind of goes with the job. But cancer was the grief. It takes away your body image and your identity and your ability to flirt. And it made me infertile and it destroyed my sex life overnight. And I was left with chronic pain and I lost my career and I lost my income. It's not just cancer. And I had no idea how a cancer I removed with a small operation affected every aspect of my patient's life forever. Seeing how you, how you, 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 period. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah. The, it, and, and it makes you ahead. face the fact that you're going to die. I never talked about death with patients, which was wrong. We never talk, think, you think about all the courses you have when someone's giving birth. In the UK, we have national childbirth classes and the coaching and the doulas and the Lamar's classes, but for dying, there's nothing. But it happens to us all. And it was only when my cancer came back the second time, my husband and I actually did our wills and he accepted that I might die before him. And it's been really, really positive to be able to embrace that and say, we're going to die. Let's get our funeral sorted out. Let's get our wishes sorted out now. Mum never did that when she was dying. She thought, it's, I'm not ready, I'll know. And it was too late. And actually, it's something we should all do. Correct. Right. Um, um, for those of you who um, haven't read the book, it's, it sounds like the book is, is, is going to be um, all doom and gloom, but it's, it's not. She has a very interesting way of writing that's very often put a smile on my face and sometimes even make me giggle um she's she's a little a little bit of a, uh you're funny writer i want you're good. it to be funny i want it to be light-hearted and funny and full of hope and all the funny stories you have as a junior doctor I me mean, what i remember i trained under my maiden name of ball b-a-l-l -L, and i did urology so i was dealing with men's testicles and they said it was dr ball come to see me and all the things that you find, these funny Welsh patients. I did a, I used to do an erectile dysfunction clinic in this tiny little village. And I went to shake the hands of a patient and he dropped his trousers and I shook his penis. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> all these funny little things that get woven through and all the lighthearted stuff that happens during cancer treatment, the joy and just finding a way to say, it's not necessarily the end of the world and there is hope and there are positives. And I am a happier, stronger, more fulfilled person now 
than I would have been if I'd carried on as a jobbing breast surgeon. Let Ainge or maybe not, not strange. Um, I don't know how you feel about that, that you had to go through all this to get to where you are now. I think a lot of people are unhappy in their life, but they haven't had that final oomph to make them make a really scary decision, either change their job or move across the country or do the thing they've always wanted to do, but were told they couldn't because we need the job to pay the bills. We can't do this. What if, what that? There's lots of, of things but when it happens, you're suddenly free to make those choices. And I wish a lot of, I, I wish I'd almost, I was this close to quitting breast surgery several years before. I wasn't happy. I loved the job, but I hated everything else around that life. And what would have happened if it if we were freer to actually follow our heart and say, it's okay. And it it's not failing if you quit the career you spent 20 years doing, because actually you're a different woman and it's not right for you anymore. And urgency. Um, things, or just suddenly change your perspective on your, your current life. Not not everybody has to necessarily change their whole life overboard, but yeah. somehow you get a new appreciation for the life you have. It's it's interesting how your perspective changes, I guess. <clears throat> and I, I was thinking about quitting surgery halfway through, mainly because I I was lonely. I'd been single for 10 years. I was the crazy cat lady. Um, I was bullied. I thought I'm miserable. I'd rather work in a supermarket stacking shelves than go into work and do this job. And I did some coaching to explore other careers. And I, I very low risk and I needed the money. So I stuck as a doctor. But they introduced me to a concept called the wheel of life. Have you heard of that? Oh. It's something I use when I'm speaking to kids. You can divide your life up into seven or eight spokes, such as work, fun, friends and family, your relationship, money, health, charity, all the kind of aspects. You think, well, I didn't open my credit card bills because I knew they were high, so I had no idea how much money I was spending. I rarely saw my friends because I was working so hard. What was fun? My husband and I barely saw each other because we were doing shift work. I never really did anything for charity. All these aspects of my life were really, really low. And ideally, the center is like one and at the outspokes of the wheel is 10 and you should all be somewhere around the outside. And most of my life wasn't. And it was a chance to say, right, if I'm going to be real, rebuild my life, I want to be having fun and I want to be calling my friends and I actually want to give something back to charity and just seeing life isn't all about work. And I can be selfish and say, I am Monday nights are for me and I'm going to choir and I don't care that my husband doesn't see me and has to cook his own meal. This is my time because it makes me joyful. And taking a bit of being selfish and saying, I need to do stuff for me to nurture me so I'm a better person when I come back to my family and friends. And I found that really hard to do. A lot of healing. Yeah. yeah. That's a very, very nice concept. Thank you for for explaining that. And just taking the time to read a book and not feeling guilty that I'm not spending time with my husband or my friends. This is my time for me. Putting it on the calendar. And making it happen. Yeah. Because you, you are important too. Yeah. And just, I'm going to have a cup of tea and sit in the garden and look at the birds. And that's my mindfulness. And that just reminds me that they always make me smile and it it's little things you you just start to pay attention to the stuff you've been ignoring thank you thank you for saying that i i had another question if that's okay with you um and and this one we also talked about if i can ask you um because um i think your take can help um many other people in this in this group here um, I I wondered if you feel, um, what is your belief? What is your understanding of what caused your cancer? Because mm. once you've been diagnosed with cancer, all of us are starting to wonder what caused it. You know, can I change it? Can I do something about it? Uh, did I do this to myself? All these questions yeah. go through your head, and you as as um, you know. I wonder yeah. what your take on this is. 
especially given the news of what's happening with our royal family at the moment, cancer's everywhere. When it happened, I knew I had a low risk for getting breast cancer. I had no family history. I was young at the time I was a fit, healthy triathlete. I just thought this is just really bad luck. And I know what causes cancer, I'm a doctor. But then you think, well, alcohol causes cancer. Alcohol causes breast cancer. I drank like a fish at medical school, easily drinking 30 or 40 units a week, some weeks, because that was the culture of medicine. You saw a lot of crap during the day and you drank a lot of crap at night to forget it. Did the drinking in my 20s and 30s cause my breast cancer? And I know there's no way of proving it. It may have increased the likelihood, but there's no way of saying that was the cause. We know that if you don't have children, that can increase your risk of getting breast cancer. And I didn't have kids. So is it my fault I didn't have kids? And then you think, well, there are rumors that stress and night shifts cause breast cancer. And as a doctor, I've had a lot of those. And it's, you can worry yourself silly. And I now find it really hard trying to give that public health knowledge. We know as hard as it is to hear that having increased body fatness and not exercising and drinking too much in a healthy diet increase your chance of getting breast cancer. But how do you make people who are those things not feel it's their fault? And I kind of feel it's like you need various spelling mistakes to happen and alcohol may cause two or three at a time, but there's still the bad luck that causes that third or fourth spelling mistake to make a cancer form. And although there may be things you've done in the past when you didn't know about it that contributed to it, that wasn't the only reason. So I don't blame myself. I think it's just bad luck. And if you told me when I was 20 not to drink because it can cause cancer, I'd have ignored you because I'm a junior doctor and everybody drank. I think attitudes are changing and we are becoming more aware of risk factors, but you nobody can blame themselves. And it, it's really hard to get it around your head. And I think if you live with that guilt that it's your fault, you're never going to do well. And I think a lot of women, there's no proof that stress causes breast cancer. I and mean, some part of stress is good for us. But I saw a lot of women, we are very good at juggling. The divorce, the house move, the kids leaving home, the elderly parents, we've got all these things juggling and we don't look after our health. And I often see women with massive life changes coming in who would then get cancer. And I wonder whether we need to help the women, the major, the people who look after the house, to learn to step back and look after themselves and be more selfish, just to help balance that mental, physical workload. I like your your take on it. It's a, a body is a big black box, and yeah. we still don't really understand. Um, no, every person is is different, which is not an an excuse. Um, it just means that we have a lot more understanding to do um if we ever understand it's at, at, at a personalized level it's, it's going to take many generations before we fully grasp if we ever will um but it's it's a co combination of nature and nurture some some predisposition I'm, and yeah go ahead also your your attitude to risk I was the first person in my family and my group of friends to get cancer. I didn't know anybody who'd had it. So if you don't know anyone, cancer isn't on your radar. So you think it's never going to happen to you. A bit like during COVID, all the people, all the anti-vaxxers who didn't know anyone who had COVID didn't think it was real. But if you know people who've had cancer, you're more aware and you're more risk aware. And I think that can have a big impact on how we are. Point. I would like to open it up to, to the group um, to see how this question or anything else we've discussed this far has resonated with all of you. Because I see a lot of, over the last 40 minutes, I've seen a lot of people shake their heads and um, confirm or um, related to their own situation. And I wanted to see if you wanted to share what went through your head or ask questions to Dr. O'Rear and if you have any. I think whilst you're thinking, I'd say writing for me was like therapy. It made it real, getting everything down on paper. And who knows where all the memories came from, but just getting it down on paper was a bit like dealing with my demons. And I can get it down and get angry and rant. And this isn't fair. 
and then I can kind of step back and almost rationalize it. And it's not as scary. You now I've written it down and then I can tweak it. And I, I never kept a journal or a diary through all of my life, but I just felt this urge. And it was my way of accepting you have had cancer twice, well, now three times, and it has happened. And just putting that distance between it and me. Okay, so that's interesting, by the way. Um, writing can be, there's many, many expressive methods that can be healing. Uh, art is is um better you paint or you know any any my my husband is going in and out doing his chores so the door keeps pinging um but writing is the one way in which you um but it also it, it's interesting how it perpetuates because once you start a process of remembering it triggers yeah. more memories and that can be sometimes a little confronting dealing with your demons that you've put away in a jar in the basement somewhere but now it's, it's in the living room in daylight and the lid is off and it's oh. a little little scary yeah. and it's it's okay. it's it needs to be dealt dealt with you need to go through it and um uh where i was going with this two points one is brett buchanan will be with us later today at 11 15 and you're welcome to join if you want to uh dr uri Erden. he does a healing as writing sessions where he helps you uh, express yourself in very short succinct writing sessions mm -hmm. to try to heal heal yourself and he is a, a stem cell transplant survivor living with chronic craft versus host disease many of you here know him and that's one way to help yourself whether you share your written product or not you're free to do um whatever you feel comfortable with um there was another thing i was going to go with this oh hot potato um it's yeah the hot potato method um is is how i call it um trauma um makes you remember things as if it happened yesterday yeah. um after you remember it um and so if you start remembering more it's sort of petrol process where you remember more things um, but some of those memories are painful you don't want to remember them the, the trick is that you learn over time and how to do that is a whole topic on its own uh, that this hot potato is not something you have to throw away to somebody else you need to get rid of it it's it's the key to make this hot potato less hot so you can hold it um without it causing you burned hands literally if you know what i mean in the figurative way uh, the hot the hot potato concept is that these traumatic concepts become a little less hot burn you less so you can live with with them and um, that's how i often explain it to patients and one way to do it is dealing with it head, head on when you're ready and going going through it rather than around it love that yeah. so one thing i used so mum died last two years ago very quickly five months after having her arm amputated and i used writing to cope with the grief but i used i wrote poems and i wrote hermit crab essays which you might not have heard of but it was a way of contextualizing what was going through. So they say, you take, think of a shopping list or a recipe, a recipe to make apple pie. So the ingredients for grief or the ingredients to getting angry with my husband, whatever they are, and you write down, he forgot to put the washing out or mum died or the chemo didn't work or the surgeon did this or it was missed. And then you kind of write the, the instructions. So I need to do this and I need to do that. And using a normal list to describe your grief or how you get over it is, is a way of kind of, getting it out on paper without feeling it being too raw. Mm -hmm. so the other ones, right, rejection. So I wrote one from, um, I wrote one to, to from God to my mother saying why she wasn't allowed nine lives and she, ha she had to die because, sorry, that's what happened. Because I was angry that she got taken away so soon. But it was like a Dear John letter. Dear Isabel, thank you for writing to us asking to live another life, but I'm very sorry it doesn't work like that. Look forward to seeing you up here. Bring your best golden boots. Things like that just quite an interesting way of putting a spin on trauma so you're writing it but it's not too personal yeah um i, I would like to say more but i think i'm gonna 
going to open it up for, for questions and see if the group, I think Catherine had unmuted herself. Does it mean you want to say something, Catherine? Uh, just real quick, you know, I'm a nurse, and um, so uh, I had colon cancer, and when I was wheeled into the operating room, I thought I was going to have a heart attack because I knew what to expect more so than, I don't know if it's knowing or not knowing is worse. But mm -hmm. yeah, I came through it and I'm fine now and, and, and that's great. But it was just, just that, that wheeling out of the <clears throat> pre-op room into the operating room was like, yeah. Yeah. And then I, when I finally woke up, the hospital I was at, I, I wouldn't recommend it, <laughs> but uh, you know, where's my family? Where's my family? Hours later, where's my family? Where's my family? Finally, somebody, because I was awake enough to be transferred out of the recovery room, but I didn't see anybody. And yeah, it was really creepy. That was five years ago. I'm fine now, but that one memory, that's the worst memory I think, <clears throat> was just that one minute of being wheeled. Mm. So that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> but thank you, You, yeah, I, I understand. <laughs> I have not read your book, I, I started to and I'll continue. I, I didn't finish it. I just just got into the gist of I will say one other thing real quick if you don't mind it, there's a book called quiet by a woman named Susan Kane and she was a major introvert okay and now she's out doing the same thing doing talks and TED talks and can't believe she's speaking in front of thousands of people so okay a lot of people know that book so okay that was that thank was all so, thank again, you for sharing that and I think it's really hard when you have a little medical knowledge and you know what can and can't go on in that room. And I think it's much harder. And I think it's harder for doctors to treat colleagues who are patients as well. Because you either treat them as if they know everything and they don't, they're scared and frightened. Um, I think it's really hard. But I think I, I sometimes think I'm a bit like Beyonce. I, I turn into a character when I go on stage. This is Liz <laughs> Surgeon doing her thing and then I can go away and sit in my room and read my book. Mm -hmm. And it's my way of protecting myself. I am... I'm acting when I'm doing that. They're not, they're not seeing the real me. Um, <laughs> just yeah, if we had more time, I would tell you a long story about that, but I, I want others to have their turn. Well, are there others who would like to share something, ask something, relate, whatever you want? I, I do have a question, Liz. I... I'm just curious as how, how do you instruct your fellow physicians? Like, you know, once you are, you're armed with this knowledge, I mean, how do you, how do you share that with them? And do you think it's made an impact or, um, we, you know, what, what do you do it through lectures or, um, you know, how, how does that work? I do a lot of speaking tours all over the world and I do a lot of writing and it, it comes down to, I say, it's the little things that matter. It's the words you use when you break bad news. I used to say, you know, you're lucky it hasn't spread and it's good we've caught it early because I've seen the worst. But no one's lucky to get cancer. No cancer is good to have. And we like to say, right, come in, sit down. It's cancer. You need a mastectomy. You need this. Because we know we don't shut up and count to 10 to let that news sink into the patient's head so they can come up to where we are and ask the questions that are really important. I say I used to tell patients what chemo and radio was like, but I've never heard my colleagues consent for it. I've never seen the suite. I'm clueless. I'm making it up. That was wrong. And I talk about you need to talk about sex and intimacy and mental health issues and how they live their life because a pretty scar isn't the quality of life. And just mm -hmm. little bits to say, I want you to think about this. And you might not be able to change everything, but by working in your team, Who's talking to patients about sex? Who's telling them about the fear of recurrence? Who's talking about exercise? Who's telling them about cancer bridges? You can just see them all thinking, oh, okay, I can do that. Or I can do that. And it's these little things that just start to trickle in that can make a difference. And the feedback I've had from a doctor has been amazing. And actually it changed the way my husband broke bad news to his patients, having sat next to me on the receiving end. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you for, for doing that. Cause I do think it is, it's hard. You know, I, I, yeah. Dr. Josie and I were talking about, you know, like you said, 
how you phrase it, like being on the both sides of the table. Yeah. I mean, and I think so. A lot of patients never get listened to because doctors don't want to listen to patients at conferences. I used to leave the patient sessions and go and network, but because I'm a doctor. I somehow have this respect that they can sit in a room and listen. And my job is to represent everyone who talks to me, not just my own journey. Thank you. I think that's important work. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm... I, I almost think that this hour is not long enough because I have 6 million questions for you, but well, it, it, it... another one. it's fine. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I popped up in my head is ignorance is bliss, but that mm -hmm. goes two ways. I think um, it, it goes two ways. I think for providers, not knowing what your what demons your patient is struggling with is also somewhat of a bliss because it perpetuates your your soul injury. I think so. It's 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 um, ignorance is is bliss is is a good thing up to a certain level it's protective and i think it works both ways i mean you know as an oncologist the pain of dealing with cancer you can't imagine what those people are coping with the chemo when they leave the door you can't get because you almost have to put your emotions on hold and become empathetic but you can't carry their emotions with you and i think you have to switch off to enable you to keep on doing the job and as a patient, the ignorance can be bliss, like it won't come back. I don't need to know. But now social media is full of so many people dying of cancer. It's suddenly in your face and you can't be ignorant because you can't not see it. And I wonder whether patients are being scared unnecessarily by seeing everything all at once and there's no escape. Yeah, because it's, it's getting the information when you are ready to learn more. And um, your time, not when internet Instagram wants to tell you. And I think that's a real worry. People are seeing the good, the bad, and the ugly when it can break them if it's at the wrong time. There you go. Yeah. The the other thing that I think might be relevant for some people, um, including those who are not here, but I'm gonna look look at later, is um I remember how you were torn by your decision about how to approach your breast surgery and how you were giving a Chinese menu of all the different ways you could be um, you could be operated upon and also plastic surgery for yeah. reconstruction and the Chinese menu for that. And, oh, by the way, you have to decide this in the next five seconds. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, as a surgeon, you knew, you yeah. knew what all these procedures are about. But even then, you had a very, very hard time, just like everybody who, who needs to deal with these surgical decisions about what what to pick because it's your body and this is irreversible. Yeah. Now, I was lucky I had five months of chemo to decide whether I wanted a mastectomy or a reconstruction. Most women have two to three weeks. Yeah. And you don't know what your breasts mean to you because you don't think about them, you don't talk about them. And then suddenly they've got cancer. You cannot be rational. And my brain was going, if I don't have a breast reconstruction, what will my patients think? Because I'm a breast reconstruction surgeon. Surely they would expect me to do it, which is bonkers. And I used to wear quite low cut V-neck dresses at work. And if you wear a prosthetic bra, it's up here. I'll be wearing turtlenecks. I don't want to change my wardrobe. I felt guilty that vanity was a reason for having an implant. Yet I told patients vanity is fine for having an implant because I can do it to you. And just this what's wrong, what's right. It was really, really, really hard. And my implant got badly affected by radiotherapy. It gave me chronic pain and now I'm happy being flat. And if I'd known now what I knew then, I'd have said, look, just go flat. In and out of hospital in a day, no radiotherapy, no post-term pain, no complications, thank you very much. But at the time I could not have coped with being flat. And time is an incredible healer. And I think patients don't understand what you want now is the time is right for you. But if that changes down the line because your experience of life has changed, that's okay. We can help. You I, can't I also, see the future. Correct. But I also think that um, life experiences such as yours change um, 
recommend things as a physician. Yeah. I I remember as a as I um evolved in my career that I became different in how I made recommendations to my patients. And the question is, is that good or is that bad? Um, I always wondered about that. I think it's good. I think as a young surgeon, I pushed complex surgery on patients because I wanted to play. You've got the perfect breast for this and I can do it. And this is fantastic. And now I realize we get, we're pressured to make sure a certain percentage of women have reconstructions and our mastectomy numbers are low. We do as much as we can to save breasts. Now, I don't care if every woman has a mastectomy as long as she is properly informed and consented. And when, when mom was being um, cancelled about having chemotherapy for her bone cancer, the oncologist had an hour to spend with her because it's such a rare cancer they had that time. And just to hear someone with an experience be really, really honest and say, these are the options and this is what it will mean for you and your life and what will happen if you don't and what will happen if you do. And it was like, wow, I thought I was good at this, but that woman was an expert. And it just made me realize when you have the time, you can give the patient that time to think, what does this mean to you? And how are you going to feel? And is it the right choice? And it was just, I think experience is a great thing just to be more open and honest and realistic because you've seen more. I'm asking questions, but I want to double check with the other people here. Any of you have any questions, experiences you'd like to share? Um, you don't have to, but I want to make sure you have the opportunity if you wanted to. Um, I just have a question. So I'm wondering, you have dealt with the challenge of reoccurrence, it sounds like twice. Yeah. And and we hear that again and again, somebody, a young woman who has it maybe in their 30s or early 40s, comes back 15 minutes, 15 years later, metastatic. What can you suggest for that, you know, mentality or, you know, dealing with that when you think your life is okay, we're good, we're moving along, life is great, and then boom, and you've dealt with that directly. So yeah, I, I don't have metastatic disease. I've had locals. So I'm cancer free. Okay. I'm on treatment. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. I think that my worry is a lot of women think they're cured and don't realize it can come back 15, 20, 30 years because doctors and nurses aren't very good at saying, by the way, it can come back and these are the signs to look out for because you want to be positive. And I think we we need to know within when you're given your post-op results that you know what to look out for. Mm -hmm. I don't think you need to spend, and some women will spend every day for the rest of their life thinking, is this the day it comes back? Mm. And I think it's educating people to say, right, if you get any of these weird symptoms that you can't explain, you put it in your diary. And if it's still there in two or three weeks time, you go and you get it checked out because that mental bell is horrible. Mm -hmm. And you make sure your doctor knows that you've had cancer and it could be related because a lot of patients don't tell the doctor, they assume the doctor knows, the doctor does and it gets missed. And I think it's it's informing them without scaring them, but they do need to know. And mm -hmm. family practitioners need to know that this could be recurrence to bring it back in. And it comes back down to, we now know that if you exercise five times a week, aerobic and resistance, it can reduce the risk of your cancer coming back by a third. Mm -hmm. We give chemo if there's a 5% reduction, regular exercise drops it by 30%. Cutting down on alcohol, eating a healthy plant-based diet, trying to reduce your body fatness can all reduce the risk of recurrence. And I think we need to be giving that public message. These are things you can do to take control to live as healthy as you can. It may still come back and these are what you need to look out for. And I think it's just that, that education, that information. It's a horrible thing. It took me five years not to wake up every day thinking, is this the day it comes back? And I'll still get hip pain from not stretching after run and convince myself it's in my hips. Because mm. you have that fear because it's everywhere. And I think it's a really fine balance. We also, in the UK, we now have a lot of CBT available through cancer centers to help those women with a really bad fear of recurrence learn to deal with it and learn to process and find a way to move forwards. Mm. Well, hold on, because you're saying a lot here. Um, CBT is a cognitive, it's, it's a sort of uh, psychotherapy. Yeah. It replaces one thought with, with another. 
um, in a way that hopefully at some point it becomes ingrained in, in your head. There's different types of uh, psychotherapy out there. Another one that works very well for cancer patients is psychodynamic therapy, yeah. where where it helps you put your whole life into the context of the current struggle that you're living with and strengthens your coping methods. Um, um, it helped me so much. Hmm very visible in your book and i really really applaud you on being so vulnerable um another thing that you said is um um uh, two things i guess i want to clarify N not every cancer has a um and, and even within breast cancer there's subtypes mm -hmm. some of them uh, don't don't have that late recurrence risk beyond five years and some some do so before uh, don't you start googling i would recommend don't google if you want to know if you're ready to know what is your recurrence risk uh early and late i would suggest uh write it down for your oncologist because they they can give you that information don't please don't google it on yourself um uh, tonight at midnight please <laughs> um and the the other thing that uh, Dr. O'Rearn very nicely said is all the lifestyle self-help things you can do to both um, um, these lifestyle exercise diet things give you a sense of control so it helps you physically feel better but also mentally feel better um, usually the thing I add uh, to that is um, two things one is every little bit helps if you can't do five times a week yet, if you can't do the full-blown, uh, predominantly plant-based diet, just start small, start somewhere. Um, we're all on a never-ending journey until our death uh, to continuously learn uh, who we are and how we can improve ourselves. The, the journey needs to start somewhere, start small. And secondly, if the cancer should come back knock it off hopefully never um i'm not sure you can as we discussed earlier blame yourself you didn't no. do enough you didn't try enough because like we said our body is one big black box and there's so many factors that play into our recurrence risk beyond yeah. lifestyle that it's you one no sorry i'm interrupting you you're right so right josie you do your best and um we we can give ourselves the illusion of control but there's many factors beyond that that we can't can't control i don't want you to turn your lifestyle into an an obsession um to punish yourself uh, because right. your diet and and your life are to be enjoyed you're not supposed to survive you're supposed to thrive i want you to enjoy your life um and and i hope um that today's session you found it helpful if any of you're triggered or if you have more questions you most of you know how to find jen and and or me so please reach out i don't want this to cause you any discomfort it's supposed to help you grow and dr o'reardon thank you for being with us today i always like to start and end on time and i give all of you a big big hug for sharing and being here today and um hope to see all of you soon again thank you everybody thank you thank you bye bye thank you